If you aren't disturbed, it's not art. If you aren't confused, it's not modern art. The first part was by the author Cesar Cruz. The second part was by me. I came up with that while staring at a wall light in the modern art section of the Manila Gallery. Now we have another type of art, and one of the most controversial, AI art. A computer-generated image you can create just by typing in a description, in theory. In reality, it compiles the image from art already created previously by human artists. To say they are a mite peeved about this is an understatement. It's steadily been creeping into the game world, and events are starting to come to a head. I'm not an artist, at least not with a visual medium. In the seventh grade, when I was learning where my artistic talent lay, I discovered it wasn't with a brush when I was physically removed from art class, due to a complete lack of any talent whatsoever. This was after I was kicked out of band class when my teacher put her hand on my clarinet and said, Stop. Granted, in that class, out of 40 students, I was the 43rd chair. I found my talent in game design, which led me back into art, because where would D&D be without Elmore, Paranoia without Holloway, or Palladium without Long? RPGs need artists to convey their world, which is an undeniable aspect of the hobby. Before I continue, let me give you my bona fides regarding the physical medium. I never finished an art class, but my guidance counselor had a rather sick habit of putting me in art-adjacent classes. Art theory, art history. If it put a book of paintings in front of me, somehow I was in that class, going all the way through college. I became well-versed in numerous artists, styles, schools, and various mediums. Of course, that led to the question of, when would I use any of this? The answer was Rome, 2011. On vacation in Italy, I had the opportunity to visit the Vatican Museum to see their vast collection of Renaissance masterpieces. After crawling through the Protestant entrance, I found myself in very familiar territory. Somehow, I knew the history of every piece of art in that museum. Not just there, but other Italian art museums like the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. I went through those museums giving an art lesson to my family talking exactly like this. Everybody was wondering who the hell this redneck was giving out history about the various displays and then tagging along because apparently I knew what I was talking about. Like Botticelli being unable to draw women's feet so he just used his own in his paintings. Now despite being stereotyped by my draw by more than a few people, let me tell you I am one highly educated and well-cultured motherfucker. But back to AI art. I've worked in the gaming industry for a few decades but never that in depth because it doesn't pay well. But I saw the artistic process behind creating monsters, characters, and fantasy landscapes since the 80s. I've hired dozens of artists, personally, paid them all in full, and still commission art regularly. Human artists have advantages that AIs can't copy. AI is cheap, but it is stale. It doesn't take direction worth a damn. It can't process an image in a time frame like, say, three images of someone walking down the street. It's cheap, I won't take that away from it, but you get what you pay for. AI has a history of problems with hands like human artists do. It's become a meme. I do not mean to pry, but you don't by any chance happen to have six fingers on your right hand. But at least human artists know to stop at ten when drawing fingers. There's other issues, but those are the basic ones that people will point out first. The gaming industry is reaching a pivotal moment with the barrier to entry almost completely disappearing. The cost to produce a book has become virtually minimal with online files like PDFs letting people store entire books on their phones. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars anymore on physical copies. There's a lot of games that only exist as PDFs. If you want a physical copy, then the buyer has to print it out and get it bound. Sites like DriveThruRPG allow designers to bring their games to a larger market outside their local area without blowing the bank on advertising. Funding games has become more accessible with various crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter or just taking donations while people wanting the book help fund it as you put up status updates. This has made the current era of gaming the best of times, but also the worst of times. Old mistakes are still looming with the vast number of games being produced. Like the 3.0 glut of the 2000s, many games are lost in the avalanche because there's too many out there. With the numerous missteps on the part of Wizards of the Coast, several high-profile designers are creating their own games to try and grab a chunk of D&D's market share. All these games need art, but there are a finite number of artists, and good art costs money. Good art also saves games. How many of them were picked off the shelf because they didn't skip on decent cover art? How many games died on the rack because their cover looked amateurish, or they couldn't be bothered with hiring an artist? Art is a significant part of a book's budget, and it's often the largest expense. Enter AI art. All you have to do is type your description, and it gives you all the art you need. Crisis solved. You can zero out your art budget and spend all that on advertising. Well, no. This is where the problem with AI starts to emerge. As they are effectively a computer-generated photo bash of other people's arts, you can't trademark it. The final ruling hasn't come down from the courts yet, but so far every judgment has been against it, with the latest ruling coming in August of this year. That means it can't be trademarked. Since anybody can create that exact art, they know the words to tell the computer, it has no legal protection. 
Anybody can take your AI creation, use it for their own, including putting it in their book or their merchandise. If you're curious about the case, it's Thaler versus Pearl Muter. I'll link the ruling in the description. However, the argument against AI art goes further because actual artists loathe the concept of it. Loathe isn't the right word here. There isn't a word to describe the level of hatred artists have for AI-generated images. So I'll be blunt, if you use AI art, there's a good chance you'll be blacklisted. All the established artists with huge portfolios and long careers with other companies won't work for you. If you've got some money and decide to have original artwork commissioned, they're not going to return your call. Look at the debacle where one artist used AI art for the D&D Giants book not too long ago. Watsi had to do a new version of the book, removing the AI art and replacing it with brand new drawn images. And it was just a few pieces of computer generated art. And the artist just said it was there to assist him by creating an image that he drew over. Artists don't care. They will refuse to do business with someone who skims their images with a computer to create something that they aren't paid for or aren't even credited with. They aren't joking around either. They will shut down sites that use AI art or shift away from hosting sites like DeviantArt. That one tried to create its own AI art generation program and then back down 12 hours later when a massive boycott was threatened. The Facebook page D&D Fantasy Art, which I am the admin of, had a poll on whether to allow AI art or not. I know, it's an internet poll, big deal. But it was closed to just page members, and the vote was 97% against, with 30,000 votes out of 50,000 members. The images you're watching in this video were all donated by members of that page voluntarily to showcase the various styles, abilities, and prices of human artists. There are numerous lawsuits right now challenging AI-generated art on copyright grounds, and it's not a fight the artists are willing to just give up on. Finally, the last opposition to AI art is technical. People have created a poison pill to wreck the ability of programs to skim their art for material. The program Nightshade changes online art on a level unseen by the human eye, but sabotages AI scanning by changing the tags to what the image actually is. Similar programs are being developed even further. They basically confuse the AI skimmer to what the image they're looking at is, so a dog becomes a cat. Charlton Heston becomes Gary Coleman, and so on. AI programmers are up in arms because it makes creating accurate images from the protected artworks impossible, and programs like Nightshade look to set back AI programs for years. The artists responded by comparing it to the guy stealing your lunch at work, complaining that you're dousing it now with hot sauce. The art arms race has begun, and it will go nuclear in a very short time. So you're a new game publisher on a budget. Want to have a copyright on your images and don't want to have your game company blocked on every artist's email? What do you do? You find artists willing to work on your budget. For every new publisher, there's dozens of new artists. They won't have the experience or name recognition to charge the big bucks, but they want to gain both. They will work cheaper, and their art might not be as polished, but they are hungry. Often, literally. You can visit an art site like the D&D art page on Facebook, where they allow commissions and you tell everyone what you want. Give them the style you're looking for, the type of art needed, and the theme of your art. And more importantly, your budget. You will get more offers. The better you pay, the more impressive the offers. But somebody will want to work with you. There is an artist within your budget somewhere. If you're dealing with a new artist, just commission one piece. See if they can follow instructions and keep a budget. When I created my first game, I went through nine different artists before I found Misha. It cost me about $200 to find the right artist for my card game. But then I sold about 10,000 copies, partly because of the art. The initial art is a business expense for you, but for the artist, it's a job interview. You have to put them on a deadline, give them all the instructions they ask for, and ensure they can keep that deadline. If they can't do a single piece of art on time, what happens when you commission them for 50 pieces? If someone's art isn't up to your needs, they get paid, and you have a better understanding of what you're looking for. And then it's time to look for a new artist. And if artists find out that you pay cash and pay on time, they will like you even more. Human artists have this magical ability called an eraser. They can make minor changes if asked. They will present the art in a process. And if you don't like something during that process, they can change it. Compare that to retyping the same word repeatedly trying to get the computer to understand. Now you just tell the artist that your barbarian is a southpaw and you get instant satisfaction when they switch the sword hand. Artists also have this thing called experience where they can tell you if your idea is a bad one. If your concept is too complicated, if it only looks good in your head, or it's just boring, they will let you know. They have drawn hundreds of pieces learning how to get human anatomy correct. They will also know what scenes work and what looks like just a bunch of people crammed into a phone booth. They will inform you if one of your ideas isn't going to work visually. There's something else you get with your money, their expert opinion. They can make suggestions to make your idea pop, something that a person who hasn't spent years of working on art will notice. If you want to save money on all your art, once you found your artist, there's a few steps. Ask about a bulk discount. You'll need to pay part of it in advance, but artists work best if you give them money. Negotiate a lowered rate for all the art as a whole. Then give the artist half of that amount to start with an agreed upon amount for each piece finished. 
and then put that in writing, make it a standard business contract. Artists are going to want something up front. The most experienced artists will want all of it up front. If you're hiring those type of artists, you're paying for the brand name. Some artists will give you a deal if you allow them artistic license, but you have to measure that with your need for control over your art. If you're on a tight budget, go with black and white art. D&D got started with line art, and while full color art is considered the norm now, a retro style can still attract fans and save you a lot of money in the process. Now, if you have absolutely zero dollars for commissioned art, let me tell you a little secret. There are literally millions of pieces of art created by long dead masters. If you must use free art, go perusing through the Renaissance for some of the best art ever made. Avoid the best known pieces, but realism was in vogue during that time, and for fantasy work, you can get a lot of lesser known pieces to convert them into what you need, even if you're just cutting out snippets of each painting for your book. If you need fantasy work, there's a lot of images of the goodly folk, and of course there's always Hieronymus Bosch. And all these artists are long dead. It gives your book a particular thematic style that some people will be impressed by. And when people read your table of contents, there's something impressive about seeing names like Rembrandt, Michelangelo, Bosch, Da Vinci, or Caravaggio in your credits. AI art has the problem of looking the same, which means your game will look the same as everyone else who goes that route. Nothing makes a book stand out more than having its definitive style. Even in the same game, the style of artists define game worlds. If you see Caldwell art on the cover, it's Mistara. Dirtalisi made Planescape the stuff of legend. Fabian's cartoonish wrongness increased the dread contained in Ravenloft. Holloway's Spelljammer gave the setting its sense of whimsy that it's known for. Human artists practice their talent to make their own style, which defines their work. And if their style matches your game, it will define your game. That's a good thing. I made this video with the prodding of a lot of artist friends. A few thousand, actually. I felt I owed it to the tens of thousands of artists who supported the art page. They deserve to be noticed. They deserve their art to be used as their art, not crammed into a computer algorithm and compressed into a soulless mockery of what they spent years perfecting. And now they're fighting back. And if you want your game to stand out, use real artists. Even if they are centuries dead.